Uh, my name is Pastor Kevin, and I obviously did not get the memo I was going to be speaking here tonight. So uh, it's casual Mondays for me. This is one of the two days of the week I try to somewhat make an off day. It doesn't always happen, usually it doesn't. But thank you for coming here uh, to Old Gosh Shop at Reformed Church. Um, it is just a pleasure to see so many people want to know about the history here. I can say for my own family, uh, it brought us across the country to be a part of the history here, and uh, it's such a joy to be able to serve here. Um, after Bruce's presentation tonight, actually, uh, if you're familiar with the Gut Mine House, and you'll hear a lot about it tonight, there is a little table and a booth in the back to support it. But before we uh, begin uh, any of that, let us begin first in prayer. Father God, we thank you for bringing us here tonight. We pray for safe travel on especially the local roads with the snow flurries. Uh, we thank you for uh, this little moment where we can remember winter, but we pray for spring quickly here soon, Lord. And uh, we thank you for the gift of community, the gift of having a history, and we thank you for that you are the saving God who entered into history in order to save us from our sins. We pray that in all things we are mindful of you, your goodness, and your salvation, and we share that with others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. But this is a good one. This is a good one. Uh, I'm going to talk about the history of Old Goshenhofen, this area here, the Gemeinde House in particular. But what we're going to do, we're going to do a little time travel. We're going to go back to the beginning stages of things here in uh, this area and bring it up to you. <coughs> now I'll tell you a little bit about myself is that I am a member here of the congregation and also of the consistory of Old Gosh and Reformed Church. I also serve in a historical capacity here with the church, but I'm the vice president of the Friends of the Gemeinde House. That's that little log cabin in the back here. And we're going to get into all that. But how I came here, I'm not from Pennsylvania. I'm from Virginia. Yes, my wife will be the first one to tell you, yeah, but you're born in Chicago. Well, I can't help that. <laughs> but I was raised in Virginia. So I'm from Virginia. And came up here about, oh, what was it, 26 years ago now? Yeah. Uh, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we started a historical organization called the W.S. Hancock Society. Because when I came up, my wife and her father were in the process of doing restoration of General Winfield Scott Hancock's mausoleum in Montgomery Cemetery towards Norristown. If any of you attended one of my uh, talks in the past on General Hancock, we would do that. Well, I have retired from the National Park Service, but at that time I was not. And I've done a lot of different things with the Park Service, and one thing was historic building restoration. And so I assisted with the restoration pro, uh, process, but more of the maintaining of it afterwards. Part of that, since it sat in Montgomery Cemetery, we came up with the idea that nobody knows who's buried in the cemetery. There's some great stories here. So we started doing a series of tours in that cemetery called Grave Tales. They still are alive today. And I'll get to that as well in the presentation. And from that, we decided after doing Montgomery Cemetery for oh, a number of years, we decided to take it on the road to other cemeteries within Montgomery County. And we were in Trap over at Augustus Lutheran. We did it there. We done, did a number of things. And Debbie Church right here is the one that says, you know, you got to come over to my church. We got a great cemetery. So we said, okay. And we came over. And we looked around, and yeah, it's an interesting cemetery. It's kind of more of a typical kind of cemetery. And then I see this log building back here. And I'm told that it's a Gamine house. And I'm like, that's a Gamine house. And it's like, okay, well, didn't really feel, okay, we'll do it. Well, this place grows up here. <laughs> and the history here at Old Goshenhofen Reformed Church is amazing. It's amazing. You can't judge a book by its cover. Coming down Church Road, it was like, here's this church sitting back there with a graveyard in front, a nice little picturesque thing. Okay, that's nice. But, wow. And long story short, we got involved with the, uh, the, 
church itself, became members of the church. Uh, the Gemeinde House needed restoration. There was some restoration stabilization work that has been done in the past, but now it's time to really look at the building and save this. And so that's what got me going. And that kind of developed into this program here. Because that is the start of old gosh and all, the Reformed Church, Cemetery, and everything that you see here. So we're going to go back to the very beginning. Is that, i got to go to my notes. I've got so many history things that i got to keep some notes every now and then. On November 12th of 1730, it was under Peter Miller, a Reformed preacher, old gosh and all, the church was founded. Now, some people thought it was founded a little bit earlier. That the early founding of Old or Goshenhofen, that was a few years before, but in 1730s is when Old Goshenhofen. So, this sounds like a government project. Is that you go up to the Pennsburg area, and, uh, East Greenville area, and so forth, and you're going to find New Goshenhofen, and you come here, and here's Old Goshenhofen. What? Yeah. That place is older. It's been there. It's all that. No. New Goshenhofen is older. Old Goshenhofen is younger. You know what I mean? It sounds like a government project. Actually, the way it worked with the region of that time is anything closer to Philadelphia was considered old. Anything further out past a certain line was new. And that's what it's New Goshenhofen. So, they formed. And in 1732, a Michael Weyer of a Lutheran congregation and a Jacob Keller of the Reformed congregation traveled to Philadelphia. They were going to jointly purchase land where they could build a union church of two congregations. And who they bought it from was the Penn family. Not William Penn himself. He went back to England, got himself thrown in jail, and died over there and buried over there. But the solitude, I believe, was the building that they went to. Have you ever been to the Philadelphia Zoo? That old house in the middle of the zoo is called the Solitude. And that's where one of the Penn family members were, that they purchased the land. They then came back to this area, and they began plans. Now, this is in 1732. When they go over to do it, by the fall of 1732, they have constructed a wooden temporary structure known as a Gemeinhaus. It's German for meeting house. It's a place of worship and school, all in one. It's a log building behind us. It was supposed to be a temporary structure, and yet it remains today. The building itself is, shall we call it the lone survivor, is that there's none other like it in the United States. They're gone. This is the only one left. Now, New Goshenhofen started with a Gemeinhaus themselves in 1727. It's a sketch of it. If you notice, it looks like ours. It was basically a set format, apparently, that the, uh, the Reformed Lutherans who these were union churches. Both congregations came together. They did not worship together. There were two separate services. But they were together, they were less. And so they built these structures. Some little variations between the two structures. However, the Gemeinde House itself that we have, this is the first known image of it. It was until 1858 that in the lithograph shows the Gemani House, which I've highlighted there. It also shows the second church, the graveyard. A lot of people see this lithograph and think it's actually the scale of where things are. No. <laughs> how they came up with this design of it, well, we'll see as we go through time here how actuality and the lithograph are both different. But this is the first image of the Gemani House. So it, the Gemani House itself served both congregations. It served as school and the residence for the school teacher. Now, the school teacher would also, in lieu of a pastor, now ministers in those days traveled to circuit. So you did not have a, a pastor living on site. They 
traveled around. They had a house not far. One, for example, had one in the Greek lane area, and he would travel up the Vulcan swamps. He'd go to uh, a couple of other places in this area. So in lieu of the pastor being on site, the school teacher filled in, and they would do scripture reading, prayer, and song. Church services in those days were far different than what they are today. Or you went to service on Sundays, you were there all day. <laughs> and there were breaks, probably a lunchtime break or something, but that was an all day affair. That's what your Sunday was consisted of. Now, here at Old Gosh, it's a different thing. You've got to split the day in half because one part of the day would be the Lutheran, the other part of the day would be the Forum. So one has to clear out for the next one to come in. And this is the way it works. The church, is, the building itself, when not used to the church, was a schoolhouse. And we have inside the Divine House today uh, some school desks. Not of the 1700s, a little bit later than that, but nevertheless, it's still there. But one of the pieces of furniture that we do have from the actual Germain house is here. It's the school teacher's desk. That sits up in the sanctuary today. Hopefully, when restoration of the Germain house is completed, it will return home uh, to be in the building itself. But it's up there today in the sanctuary. Time goes on. The Gemeinde House itself, uh, the congregations actually will outgrow the Gemeinde House, but the Gemeinde House still lives on. It still remains the residence of the teacher. It served as a school. As time went on with the Gemeinde House itself, is that it would become the headquarters for the Old Goshenhofen Ladies Aid Society, where the last ones to actually use the structure. In fact, this podium, which I had the laptop on, was used by them. This was in the mind house at one time. So. As the building went on, it was adapted and used, and some may hear, in fact, in a book by Phil uh, Ruth, it was Images of Upper Sulphur. It states in there that the Gemein House was torn down in 1808 and then rebuilt. That's false. The building was never torn down. What was rebuilt, what they called rebuilt, is that on the interior log walls, they put lath and plaster on the inside of the wall. They upgraded the building. As time went on, different upgrades of the building happened. For example, you see the doors that are here. Those doors are still there. Those doors were not original to the combined house itself. They probably came from the later church that would follow. And that. So there's a lot of adaptations that were done. And this picture here, it was literally stuccoed all the way around. And it's gone through many, many changes in its time. Here's a better picture of it showing the front and the side facing the current church were stuccoed, but then the wood siding. The wood siding would appear on the Gamay House in the 1850s. You call that lithograph I showed. It showed the, the wood siding on there. In our restoration process that we're looking at doing, we're going to bring the building back to its 1732 uh, appearance. Another view of the Gemeinde House itself, this is when it was still actively being used by the uh, Ladies' Aid Society. I believe this was this is 1964. You can see the comparison of the Gemeinde House from the 1960s. I always like then and now pictures. And I've got a bunch of them here. So uh, try to get the exact angle to the job. So and plus you can see the Gemeinde House today. The roof itself was replaced not you know you know, back in the uh, 90s, and that it was all shake wooden shake roofs. Eventually that will go back, but it was replaced. And it was a good thing this happened. The metal roof that's on there today, of course, it's not very correct to anything, but it stabilized the structure. One thing you'll learn with old buildings is that if you have a good roof on the structure, it will help preserve that structure. The roof fails, the building fails, the bulldozers have come in and it's gone. Plain and simple. So, but that roof alone has saved this building. Keep in mind, we're looking at a building here that's going to be in 10 years, 300 
years old. And that for a log structure to stand for 300 years, really a Today, this is what we look like. Doesn't look bad. Doesn't look bad. It's not correct. But this is the view of the mining house itself. The way it's laid out is that you had two doors in the front. And it's like, oh, that's ridiculous. And some have said that one door was for the men and one door for the women. Well, that's true in some churches. A church, for example, where I used to do a lot of uh, living history programs down in Virginia, outside of all the uh, Middleburg, Virginia area, is Mount Zion Old Baptist Church. They had two doors. One was for the women, one for the men. They sat separately in the church. A lot of churches did that. That church took the extreme because you had a door on each side there that allowed blacks to come in and they sat in the balcony. So you had everybody in that church. But this, you had the main door led into the main room called the Stab. The second door led into the private quarters and office of the teacher. The other door, which is more of a very correct door, is a Dutch door, is into the kitchen area, and there's another one on the back side as well. The inside. This is basically how we look today on the inside. Now, for uh, Reformation Day, a couple, uh, what, last year, dressed up the inside of the Gemini House to kind of give folks an idea of how things would have been on the inside itself. So we'll start over here. This would be the teacher's office. Very narrow corridor. It probably jogged off to the back a little bit because there is a small window in the back side of the Gemini House, which I think was the window into that part of the office because currently there is no, no window there. There's a staircase that never was. In the you have the stop. This is the main room. And the main room itself is the, where the worship would take place and where school would happen. And as you can see, the desk is over here. We also have display cases in there. The idea with the Gamayan House is to restore it back to its 1732 impression. It'll be a place where one could sit for quiet contemplation, and it'll also be a museum. Because we have items. Oh, do we have items in this church. They have been hidden in every little nook and cranny, and I've crawled around from the steeple itself all the way to the cellar, and I have found stuff. Oh, good stuff at that. And so we hope to have it on this display. The kitchen area, or the kitsch, this is a photograph here. The chip, the um, chip stack and cooking heart has all been rebuilt. And these will be upgraded as well. And as you can see in there, Gemini uh, House interior, prior to uh, completing re uh, renovation, that is coming soon. I'll talk about that in a little while. Well, both congregations begin to grow. This area begins to grow. When all this was established, there was not any upper and lower Salford. It was South, uh, Salford. I think Frederick Township was part of it as well. And so they need a larger church. So in 1744, larger church. Again, we go back to the lithograph. Again, there's the Gemini House. There's what I call the 44 church. It's made out of stone. It's a lot bigger to handle both congregations. Plus, there was a balcony in it. The closest I can find to anything today, how the interior of this building might have somewhat appeared, is if you go over to Trap. And you go into the old building there at Augustus, you'll see the balcony up there. It's a little bit more ornate than what this was. But that's what the inside was. You could have more people in there. Of course, New Gosh and Aben had their own as well. And isn't it interesting? Must have been the same contractor building. Because <laughs> again, they both look the same. But New Gosh and Aben tore their down, theirs down to build the current church that they have in the first uh, The 44 church, well, before I get to the next slide, the 44 church, they didn't really tear it down. They uh, disassembled it and reused it, and we'll get to that. But I can tell you right now, it's still here. And I can also give you a good idea of what the dimensions of the 1744 church are. 
First of all, you're sitting on top of it. Secondly, see these columns? This column's here, that's that column, that's the width. The length, these columns here, that back wall would have blocked us. This is the 44 church. Inside that church, you had an altar or an altar table. And it, Michael uh, Schlatter brought the first Bible from Europe, from Holland, to here. And it sat on that altar. It still does today because, see, right there? That's the altar. Back in the 50s or 60s, for some unknown reason, somebody had a better idea <laughs> to recover that thing and remodel that thing. Yes. We're hoping to get that restored back to that. And believe it, Lena, it's there. And Pat, you've looked underneath the stadium. So it is there. Sitting on top of it, a Bible. Interesting story about that Bible is that it was found in a trash heap under a stairwell. There was a bunch of reports, and that's the only survivor that's still here. See, this place has got stuff. It's been hidden, it's got stuff. And uh, so there it sits. I'm the only survivor one that we know of. Sitting there. Now, he is also, uh, and he wrote in his diary that, oh, let's see, uh, he wrote in his diary that he, in September 20th of 1746, that he preached the first sermon in the 44 church. So, that altar, the Bible, where you're sitting, the 44 church. It was covered in tiles. Where the mine house had wooden shakes, this had clay tiles. This is what the remnants of them that we found around the mine house and grounds, these are from the 44 church. What you see there is over at Conrad Weiser's home, out in Wollensdorf area. It was covered with the same tiles. And I add this in here so you can get an idea of how those tiles were laid. Um, on that church, but we do have remnants of it. And what's interesting, you can see the design, basically done by hand on each one of the tiles. You have it here. Too. So, same tile manufacturer. Probably. There's cornerstones that appear in the 44 church and were brought to this current church, and they just today on that corner on the outside. You have a Lutheran stone, and you have the Reformed cornerstone. Then you have the Union Stone of them both. And it's reported that inside the Union Stone is a time capsule. Never open it, never look. Can't get to it because it's embedded in the wall. Got to do some damage for that. Not going to have that happen. But it's supposedly a document that talks about the union of both churches. How they both have come together to construct this building for worship, and to move forward as a joint church, and basically, and nothing will tear them apart. 30 years ago, they split. <laughs> and then Luther Church is the descendant of the old Goschenhofen Lutheran Church that was here, moved and built Advent Lutheran Church, old Goschenhofen Reformed Church, remained here we are today. This is what you're sitting on top of. This is the original foundation of the 44 church. So it runs where you see these walls going down, that's where these pillars are. That back wall is right here. But it was taken just about under where you're sitting, Debbie, right under that. And so there's also at one time a furnace down there, all kinds of things. But you can see some of the rafters that have come through here. When they enlarged this church, which they did, as we all know, they built another stone wall on the outside and used this as a support foundation as well. So there is a firm foundation in this church, physically and spiritually. Then, in 1846, a building was built next to the church. This is actually the replace <coughs> housing for the teacher, who is now also the organist in the 44 church. That church stayed in existence almost, well, all the way into the time of the Civil War. 
1846, they built this building that would be for the teacher in Oregon. Later on, it would be for the sexton who lived there, who did the maintenance and also the, the graveyard itself. And now it's the parsonage for the church. Now, when a permanent pastor was established, is when it became a parsonage. Is that, however, prior to that, when you come in off a of, uh, skip back, take that turn on the church road, you see those two ranch houses there? Those were the two parsonages to this church back in the 60s or the 70s, something like that. Was that about right, Pat? Is that one was the Lutheran, one was the Reformed. So those two branches actually were that one. Was the then a growth happens. 1858 comes about. Old gosh and hopping. Uh, Union Church. Well, the congregations grow once again. Funny how that happens. And when that happens, you've got to build bigger. So when I said they disassembled the 44 church and it's still here, they used the stones for the exterior wall and added to it for the structure in 1858. If you notice, there's a little bit difference to it. The front doors, for example, there's no stained glass. We'll get to that in a few minutes. If you were coming down Church Road in, the, in 1900, this is what you would have seen. That's the same view that we have today, but a little bit more rustic. In fact, the road was penned out. I don't think it's changed, has it? But anyhow. <laughs> but you'll see the cemetery off to the side with an iron fence. You'll see a better picture of that. It runs all the way down. It would be nice if it was there today, but unfortunately World War II took care of that. Then you've got a view taken from the back. This picture was uh, taken in 1914, but, and it shows just prior to the renovations of this current structure. And I'll we'll get to that in a second, but you can see some identifying points there. You have the graveyard, the cemetery. You have the church itself. There's the Gemeinde House, You're standing there being a witness to time go by. You have Church Road. Well, wait a minute. That's Church Road. Mm -hmm. Not originally. Church Road originally branched off the skip back, cut through the woods, and part of it is still there, runs up past the spring house, past the lich gate, that's the stone cemetery wall, past the Gemeinde house, past the side of the current church, and then bank down to the left, as it does today. You still had, a bit of a, there's still a little bit of a bridge. Yes, yes there is. Yes there is. Hopefully we get that slide. Get that all developed back through there for the road is somewhat restored. We can use it for walking trails and so forth. Many, many plans. <laughs> but if you notice, here, you can see some buildings here. Those are what I call parking garages for horses and uh, carriages. If you go into Lancaster, you see their meeting houses, you see these type of barn structures there, protective structures, we have them here. And plus you can see, which is the parsonage, the barn, the barn, there was a barn, this was actually the farm as well, because the teacher, organist, farm this land, had livestock and so forth. This is the same view today. <coughs> as you can see, kind of narrowed the scope here, so I can do it here. Here's the parsonage, here's the church, there's the mine house, spring house is down here, cemetery there, there it all is. That's what it looks like today. I told you I love the then and now shots. And that one was tricky to find. <laughs> With all the bramble back there from the debris from the storm and still laying back there. And getting through all that, you get that shot. But uh, there it is. As you can see, this is how Church Road comes up today. What I mentioned, through the woods, past the lich gate, past the mine house, kind of highlighted it there with the arrow, and up through. Now, as far as that barn, well, you can see what's left of it over there on the left, and, well, we passed the spring house, get to that real quick, is the spring house itself is a reconstruction. Ken Oshler did the work on this, um, and brought it back basically to life, and that's going to be the next probably one of the next things that we're going to do with any type of structural type of work to bring that up as well and clean up that area. But there it is. That's what's left of the barn. 
The size of that barn is exactly the size of the, well, I have it as a storage building there, but we're kind of using it as a garage now for uh, lawn maintenance equipment and so forth. All you have to do is take this roof off, build it up, and there's your barn. It was a bank barn. On the other side, there was the bank, and this was the low side of it. But that's been there. What's interesting about that, I can't pinpoint exactly when it was built. 1800s, later part of 1800s, 1900s, something like that. But what's interesting when you look around on the, this, which would be the east side of it, and also over here, well, you see these marble things? They're from headstones. They use some stones from the cemetery for it, all our headstone bases for the construction of it. So which leads me to believe it was in the early 1800s. The view from the cemetery to the church is then and now. This is 1914, showing the building. This is today. Do you notice anything different in the building? Same building, isn't it? Looks the same, identical. Not really. Because there's a change to come. This is what the interior of the uh, 1850s church looked like. Where is this? upstairs. Give you a little idea of some of the highlights of the stuff that we've got around here. The original pulpit. Well, that's what it looked like when it sat in the mining house. It's been restored and you walked right by it when you came in. We have it right at the front door. You can take a good look at it. The lectern. We have this that sat on top of it. That'll be put back down. The uh, lectern stand. It's there. up in the sanctuary today. And you can see where it sat in the uh, 1850s photo. The two chairs now are the usher chairs that are upstairs. And of course the pulpit itself. This shot, well, before I get to that, some of the details of the inside of the 1850s church. The ceiling and walls were painted in stencil. Beautiful, beautiful. The only surviving pieces of that are, if you go up the ladder into the, the attic and then to the belfry area, you will see this. It's a very tight squeeze. But it's the only remaining thing. The detail is just phenomenal. Inside the sanctuary itself, there was a chandelier. This was all oil lamp lit. The chandelier hung in the center. There it is. We have it still. Got it in storage over at the second floor of the wine house. It's bronze. <coughs> and it was attached to a rope. The rope was lowered where they could light the oil lamps to raise it up. Keep in mind, in the 1850s, this is not kerosene being burned. <coughs> this is whale oil. <coughs> and if you've ever smelled whale oil, <coughs> it's horrible. But that's what the lighting was. But where this is, is where you're sitting. All that, and you see the sanctuary of 1858, set right here. This was the, the wall to the exterior wall, right here. The pulpit was here, everything was here. So you're sitting, you were sitting, you're sitting on top of the 1744 church, you're sitting in the sanctuary of the 1858 church. See, you don't have to move when you go into all these buildings, isn't it amazing? Then in 1915, a change happened again. Now this change, as it says on the, the stone above the door in the front, it says that an annex and remodel was done in 1915. Now people think annex, that's another building. That's a separate building. Now the terminology for annex is they enlarged the building. The back section of the building was added, which is now another classroom, kitchen area and so forth was that. The front stayed basically the same. And what they did is on this side and on that side where the other columns are, that was a balcony. Well, the balcony, everything was enhanced. The, uh, the floor was closed off on the top, creating the sanctuary upstairs is what they did. So the annex and remodel is that. This became a fellowship room, place of gathering, meals, and other, and 
we use it today for classrooms and just like everything. And then the sanctuary upstairs was built at the same time. The stairs going up are the same because those were the stairs in the balcony. But now they go up to the sanctuary. The door even changed. Why? I don't know. I kind of like the old door set up. But the door even changed to the current door that we have today. As far as the outside look, well, here you go. You had 1858. The trees that are in front, 1920, yeah, some trees disappeared, but what hasn't disappeared is this Norway spruce. It remained. It remained until this happened. And it took it. That tree was well over 100 years old. And it took one tornado and storm to take it out. That's what it did. The same glass was added later on. In fact, here they are. The same glass uh, installed after the 1950 re remodeling, it was made by William Wright Company of Philadelphia. Possibly he's buried in this cemetery. Is that he was the owner of it. And actually comes in. The window, the stained glass were put in by the Lutherans. The reforms, reformed and their church are very plain, very simple. The Lutherans put in the stained glass that we currently have today. So that's where they came from. And if you notice over the door, it's still related as a Union Church, Lutheran and Reform. The addition on the back. Here's a little bit of reality, what it looks like. Today's church, the dotted line shows from that section back. There is that close-up of that picture in the cemetery. I said, you notice the difference between the two? Now it's plain to see. Also, we have relocation of chimneys. Another thing about building. The combined house is another thing as well. There's photographs showing the, uh, the, fire, the chimney stack, large, small, different sizes of Gamine House in three different locations over the years. Chimneys tend to walk around here. I don't know how that happens. But you had the old coal fire chimney that was in the front. Remnants of where that furnace sat is downstairs here still. And then now, there's the chimneys back here. But you can see the addition. <laughs> that was added onto the back. But yet they kept the architectural design of the building intact. If they didn't do it, this is what it would look like today. It's kind of a neat view. It's kind of, hmm, it's not bad. But uh, as you can see, it's a lot smaller. Through time, this is how things look. You have 1917, or rural. You can see the barn, see the combined house. We jumped to 1920s. They put in the iron fence, which would disappear in the scrap metal drives. And it, it went all the way from almost uh, Skip Back Road all the way to the front of this church and around almost to the Demonte House. That was that much iron fence. Imagine how much that would cost today. Right on. And then, of course, today's view, same angle. So you can see the, the differences. That went landscaping wise, trees disappeared over this time, which they're slowly coming back. The steeple pretty much stayed the same throughout the, the whole time period. Not much change at all, but there is one change. There's something missing the railing. We talked about maybe putting it back, restoring the look once again of it, but we haven't got anything concrete on that. The interior. <coughs> After the renovation, what it looked like, and today. I point out this clock. You see it on the wall? Look right there. There it is. It was up in the sanctuary for a long time. We got another one up there, vintage. But uh, that one, you can see it right there. What's interesting today, in the 1917 photo of today, look at the ornate stenciling in pastor's area and the church itself. It's gone. The only things that are remaining are what you can just barely see in this photograph up on the top there. But this is the way it looked. Very ornate on the inside. And of course, today. Then we have the, the burial ground, now known as the cemetery. Most uh, churches had burial grounds. And this was for both congregations. And now things are moving on with the cemetery. It's, it's open for all. 
but it was for both congregations. As you can see, the older section was closer to the church, and the newer sections are further away. But it kind of gives you an idea of that view from the graveyard itself. Some of the headstones we have in that graveyard are amazing. And that the oldest stone that we know is right here. This photograph was taken after I repaired it and put it back where it was. For a long time, it broke off and the top half was stored in the Gemeine House. And uh, we were able to reassemble it and put it back where it belongs out there. Is that some of the other stones, and probably the most iconic stone in that cemetery is the gable headstone. It's a beautiful headstone. We're in the process with the cemetery associations getting that restored. We had stabilization work done on it, and now it's to restore it, which is going to be taken out of the ground, and it's being done professionally. And that, so this will last and last and last. But in Pennsylvania, to find such headstone art uh, is just amazing. And to understand what all this is, you'll have to come to a class that I'll be doing. Uh, in April. I'll get to that. <laughs> what, what, what was the date on the old stone? The old stone is 1744. Or excuse me, 45. 1745. And I think it's a uh, Hilda Bible. So, we go through the journey from time. We go from the Gemeine House in 1732 to the uh, 1744 Stone Church to the 1850 Enlargement Church, the 1950 Annexed and Remodeled Church, the, at that time when I took the picture in 2021, with the Gamayan House. The walk that we've gone through. But, okay, but we're not done. There's a lot going on here at Old Gosh and Hoppin Reformed Church. Is that various Bible studies, uh, adult uh, men's study, women's study, children's classes, you name it, Sunday school, you name it. It's being done here at Old Gosh and Church. This is by no means just Sunday and that's it. This is a seven day a week, year round church. You have a schoolhouse. And we have a schoolhouse, yes, as well. So, a lot. And it's interesting with the schoolhouse is that education has always been a part of old Goshenhoffen. The Gemeine House kicks it off. It still lives today. The tradition lives on. Education still is the keystone of the young and so forth. All Christ Center, which is the interesting part of it, is that everything evolves around that. We do uh, community work during all the uh, recent unpleasantness, let's call it. This church was active in uh, supplying meals. We also have the oyster picnic, the world famous oyster picnic that continues to go and go. Some of these pictures here are some of the original. I think some of your folks in these pictures, are they still here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's been going for quite a long time. It's a very big fundraiser, a lot of fun to do, a lot of people show up for it, and it's another one, just another time that old gosh can do we did something last year, what's never been done before, is Reformation Day. Is to mark that day. And uh, we actually had a debate take place in the sanctuary between Martin Luther and Tesla. And there's Martin Luther sitting right there. Tesla. 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 I'm sorry. Tesla. 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 Tesla's doing electric cars and flying space things. Yes. And, uh, but a very lively debate, but historically accurate to show a little bit of the insight between uh, Martin Luther and what he will basically change and start the Reformation in the Catholic Church. It's a wonderful event. And also at that time is that with the Gawain House, we kind of, with the friends of the Gawain House, came into official like this in our poobah here, Rose Kramer, our president. And you can see... Her and I, I'm the vice president, we're unveiling our logo for it. We got the bulk. We're a nonprofit. And we're a nonprofit. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. And yes, we accept donations most gratefully because those donations are going for the restoration of this building. Some of the things we're doing with the Friends of the Gawain House to raise funds. We're looking at $60,000 for phase one of the restoration work of the Gawain House. 
I can tell you right now, as of today, I've got a, on Wednesday, another conversation with him, a phone conference with him, met with him a couple times here on site. How many have watched, and I know, Rick, you have, on, uh, it's now Magnolia Network, but it was DIY, a fellow by the name of Jeff Devlin with Stonehouse Revival. If you've seen the show, Jeff is going to be doing our restoration work this year on the Combined House. And uh, we're very happy that this is coming about. It's a long road to get to this point. But scope one is the outside stabilization and the interior restoration of the building itself that he's going to be doing. Um, I mean, we're excited about this. But we're in the final stages, talking with him, get things set up. As he said to me today that, yeah, we can get this project going this year. So uh, he's going to be coming in here. So you might want to stop by and say hello to He had his house done by him, too. How, how's the work to this day? Top notch? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have Jeff come in. Are we going to be on the TV show? I, no. I don't know. We're not looking for that. That's not the, the basis for this because this man is very talented, very highly recommended. He's also with the uh, Valley Forge Building Restoration Consortium that takes care of and the restoration work on a lot of buildings at Valley Forge as well. He's worked on other historic projects. He's the right man for the right job, and that's what we need here for the best. And he's it. But some of the fundraising that we're doing, where we can match back the, the 60000 needed, we have our Fashnacht Day. This is a Rose Kramer. Well, most of our special events here is a Rose Kramer that I'm showing here. Rose is our Fashnacht Queen. We have the Fashnacht Affair, which is a... Uh, what we call it is our process of getting the dough made up and getting it ready for the next day. We come in with a whole army of folks and we're frying these things and they're not the donuts that you would get at a store. These are German Faschnats, the real thing. I mean, that's one thing that we look at here when we're doing restoration or anything with the Mine Husker is authenticity. And so we're going with that with the Faschnats itself. Had them, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, too bad. These things are great. You got to get them next year, and then, then we spend a whole day frying them up. We have a good time doing it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. But you know, we're also doing a plant sale, <laughs> and which we did historical plants last year, and a miserable rainy day. But we, it worked. People came, and we're doing it again this year. We have a date. We'll let you know. <laughs> we'll let you know. We have a, a website as well for the Gemeinde House. And Abby, the website? Uh, 1732gemeindehouse.org. That's right. Abby, Rose, Karen, Kevin, Pat, Ginny, all part of anybody else in there? Uh, Louie. Ah, Louie, there you are. Are all part of the Gemeinde House Bruce, Restoration Group. Bruce, May 14th. May, oh, no, May 21st. 21st. We'll get back to you. May 21st. May 21st. No, May 21st, yeah. And you can also find the, the Mine House page by going to the old Gosh Shopping page, and there's a link on the top bar. Yeah. So, there you go. Oh, and, We're also on Facebook. and James is now our newest member yes. to the Gemeinde House. And if you'd like to be a member oh, of the Gemeinde House mm -hmm. crew, we'd love to have you. Mm -hmm. Just see so you got Rose and myself. Mm -hmm. and Maybe we can figure out the date of our next meeting. You don't have to be a member of Old Gosh. No, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. But Anybody like can join. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd like to. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. It's very nice. So, lots going on here. We also have Grave Tales. And there is a person totally responsible for that now. So, if you want to blame somebody for it, she's sitting right there. It's my wife, Karen. And she puts this together now. And it's the history of the cemetery and so forth. And as we have, you'll never know who you'll meet when we dig up the past. It's not a ghost show. It's not spooks or anything like that coming out and scaring you. This is a history lesson of the people that are buried in our graveyard. There's some great history there. Paul, you you're part of it too. And it talks about his relative, uh, what was her name? Sir? Alice. Alice. And that's a uh, great story. I want to give it away. I want folks to come to it. And yeah, the only red granite stones in the whole cemetery, the whole Merkel family. Yeah. There you go. There you go. The history here is amazing. Cemeteries are an interesting thing. Is that 
I know I'm going to date myself by doing this reference, but when you want to learn something history, you went to a library. Now you go to the internet. But you go, went to a library, and you saw books. And in those books were the stories of people and places and so forth. You come to a cemetery, and you find the people that are in those books. So this is the library in itself, the history of this township and this region. Why am I out there? Great hills is a great way to come. We also do something, there's another thing that I gotta blame Karen for again, is that Wreaths Across America. This is where all the military, all the soldiers, they're buried in graveyards, national cemeteries are recognized by having a wreath placed on their graves. And it's growing. This year we had how many wreaths? 75. And we're looking for next year? 100. 100. And it's growing. And again, if you wanna know more about this, seek her out. Hey, yes. Do you know how many bedrooms are buried? <laughs> Not yet. We're still counting because yeah. what um, um, Howard. Howard Howard Landis did a uh, a thing on how many veterans are in the cemetery. Then we had the DAR ladies come in, did some, and they found more. <coughs> so we're kind of putting the two together when we put a number on that. But. Old Goshenhaven, this is from the air, what it looks like. You ever want to know what an aerial view of this area is? And with all this going on, as I have on there, and the thing, we're just getting started. There's just so much stuff that we want to do here at Old Goshenhaven. Is that, you know, we have a mission here. And the mission is <coughs> in Jesus Center, Bible Center. That's what it all is. Our, our different committees are basically ministries that we have. And it all to serve is what we do. It's a great journey, and it's going to continue on and on that we do here. And be a part of it. Little information about the church itself, the contact, any information you want, you know, any questions and so forth that you have about the church and what's going on here. Um, also, little shameless plug for what's coming up in October is our, well, excuse me, not in October, in April. This is on the 23rd that I talked about. Um, this is a class that I'm doing here at the church. It will be upstairs in the sanctuary. It's called All That Remains. It's the history of burial grounds, churchyards, and cemeteries, and much more. So if you ever want to know how all that got started and how things went along, and uh, to today's point, come to this. And it's being done through the uh, Old Goshenhaven Cemetery Association, which I am also the acting superintendent of the cemetery at this time as well. And as I like to joke, so that means I'll probably be the last guy to let you down. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll leave that back up there. Any questions at all? That's the history of it. Um, you know, basically, from start to finish, but our focus is the Gamine House itself and the fundraising efforts we have to preserve this historic building. Yes, sir. You had a question? In the back corner of the church are the cornerstone yes. plaques with the builder. That seems to me to be the addition. Yes. Those cornerstones have marched around a little bit. In fact, I have a picture of them laying out just by themselves, like blocks. Stone blocks later. Now you said something about a time capsule behind those? Yeah, there's two stones, one Lutheran, one Reform, and then there's one that's a joint stone. So allegedly, allegedly, I can't prove it, I can't prove it, but I found a couple of things that make reference to it. In fact, there's even a reference in uh, uh, Philip Ruth's book <coughs> on uh, images of Upper Sulphur that talks about this document in the stone itself. To get that, it would cost it. And uh, so we're not going to pull that out and look. So right now it's going to have to fall into the supposed it's there. But it's on the addition, which was... Right. Eight. Well, actually, there's three sets of cornerstones back there. Right. There's one from the three that Bruce sold, showed you from the 1744 church. And then there's two sets from the 1858 yeah. church. The building committees. And then... There's two sets from the 1915 edition. Right. So they took all the cornerstones from the 1744 and 1858, and then the 1915 edition, and they put them all back in that corner. Because right. the original, I believe, has Heaster's name on it. Yes. And the person fact, that built the Gable Tavern. I'll tell you what. Why don't we uh, walk back here? Yeah. Well, you know. 
Gable Tavern. Hmm? Where's Gable Tavern? It's in Texas. It's in Texas. It's in Texas. <laughs> we don't want to go there anymore. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Believe me. It's Jenny, we know. All right, come on, I'm getting there. Do we have any of those handouts, Kevin? Do you remember, or do we have any of those? Remember, we had a handout about this. There we go. There they are. That's it. Now, the one I'm talking about, what the document allegedly is in, is in this one. This one is the Lutheran. This one's the Reformer. And what was the name of the building name? Um, Easter. Easter. They built the, the oh, house. Here's Gable. Here's Gable right Philip here. Gable right there. Right. Uh, but supposedly... Easter's right on the top. Okay. Supposedly, Easter built the house, the little nice little mansion at the bottom of Summitown Hill. Yes. And Gable, or somebody else, the name, built the Gable Tavern, which were early buildings here. Right. And the two of them came together and worked on the gosh hop and the church as builders. Okay. And they came over from Europe mm -hmm. on the same boat. Ah, okay. okay. Which, was, which was quite interesting. So I take it they, they were stonemasons. They had to be. Well, they, they were brick down there. They made well, bricks. Brick. Most yeah. stonemasons can do brick as well, but they were burnt stone. Now, the other the second question I have is, are there plans to get this to be the second or the third thing on the National Historic Register? It's on the game plan. Uh, it's, it's, as I said, this place is so rich. I mean, the, the churches themselves, as I always like to say, all three and a half churches are still here. Uh, the graveyard itself, um, yeah, it's got all these elements in here. With uh, the restoration of the Gamayan House, hopefully will help seal the deal itself uh, to get on National Register. Now, a lot of people think National Register has the magical power to save things. It does not. It just makes it a lot easier for you to get uh, fundraising done is what it really does, and it gets you on a national listing, which is a nice thing to have as well. And that, but that's on the game plan. Because the only place in Upper Southwark is the Birdie Bridge, right. which when they went to repair it, they had to restore it to stone. They couldn't rip it down and put concrete there. Right. And you know, fortunately, with who we have with our consistory and so forth, we're all very aware of the history of this church, even though at one time there was talk about knocking a hole in a wall here, building a whole extension off of the church. Well, those are just plans sitting in there gathering dust, dust and that. It's not going to happen. Uh, but, yeah, it's, in fact, we're even looking for historic, put historic waysides up around, uh, establishing a historic zone around this building, the Gemeinde House, down to the Spring House, and so forth, with historic waysides. You've seen them. You go to the National Parks, you'll see them. On there, so we've been working on plans for that. Uh, the the walking tour. And the, the, the Pennsylvania historic. Tour. Yeah, we're even looking to go. There's one or two right routes. We're going, looking at the uh, Pennsylvania historic marker out front. And if things don't work there, we're looking possibly to do our own for it, like uh, Skip Back Historical did as well. But there's all option uh, avenues open that we're doing because we want this place, you know be well documented history-wise, and that plus a lot of folks know what we're doing here. I mean, we've got some great stuff going on, and it's all because of Pastor Kevin and his lead that's going on here. Yes, I'm giving you credit for that. <laughs> but, um, My mom's uncle, Wilson Geiger, used to paint the steeple here with a uh, rope and tackle. And I've you seen the name inside the steeple, because anybody that painted that thing put their name on the inside. I've seen the name Geiger. Wilson Geiger was yep. my mom's I've seen that name in there. And I used to work on that Gamayan house. Did you? As a kid. I, the Lutherans, I was a Lutheran there. Mm -hmm. uh, with John Schilling, Pastor John Schilling, and Ken Oschlager. Right. And they had a thing called the Lutheran League. Okay. And they had work projects. And we used to come on Saturdays and work on that. Oh, no, very good. It was a long time ago. I think I was 12 then. Yeah, I think that was probably the last time it was really worked on. <laughs> yeah, probably. It's just been maintained. Maintained. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for attending. Let's give. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
we have a lot in common with the Friends of the Mine House. And um, I think that it's wonderful to have a group that gets together and say we're all about preserving something very important in Upper Salford, but of course we have many important things in Upper Salford. And so thank you all for coming out this evening. I know the Friends of the Mine House has a table over here. We have a table over here. You have one another to talk to. So let's continue to make history together. So thank you so much for coming out this evening, and thank you for hosting us.